I want you to put yourself in the position of someone who's been who's working full time at a company who's going through a safe transformation, who's trying their best. Maybe they're a scrum master, a manager, a developer, whatever. Okay. And they're trying their best and they're seeing some benefit. Maybe they're finally starting to get it and they get a message about, oh, there's a new article about fake agile on Forbes and it's shitting on safe, right? (laughs) So what you're doing is not real. Okay. And essentially what you're doing is not real agile. So try again. Hi, this is Martin Fowler, and you're listening to the Agile Uprising. Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Agile Uprising podcast. I'm your host, Troy Lifewood, and with me, I have Andrew Leff. Uh, Andrew. Hey, Troy. And hopefully, I'm still going to say your last name correct, Paul. It's Paul Elia, correct? Elia. I, there are a couple of pronunciations, but don't worry about it, man. How you guys doing? <laughs> all right. Up, Paul? So I, I still butchered it after all this time. Um, I just went to see family, and we have different ways of pronouncing it in my, my family, so <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I can't blame anybody. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. So... Uh, yes, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about this Forbes article written by Steve Denning, uh, who has written quite a few books um, in the leadership space, and he has a new book in the Agile space. Um, and he wrote an article entitled, let's see if I can, I don't want to butcher the Agile, Understanding Fake Agile. And, and correct, you guys, correct me if I'm wrong, because you've read this, uh, this blog post that the premise of this article is that there's such thing as fake agile and there's such thing as real agile, right? And that the consultancy firms of the world, I'm, I'm summarizing this, but the consultancy firms of the world are peddling fake agile. This is what it seemed like. Here. And that the real agile is done by companies who don't call themselves agile. For example, Amazon, uh, as one example that he gave. Um, so that's the kind of the premise of the article. Now, I don't personally have a problem with most of the things in here as far as are there people who are selling a bill of goods to make money? Oh, sure. But that happens everywhere. Right. Um, so I wouldn't argue that point, nor would I argue that um, companies like Amazon and Google and Facebook and a lot of companies demonstrate um, business agility, particularly Amazon clearly does when it comes to the ability to pivot and get things out quick to the market and learn and things like that. But that's not all Agile is, right? I would argue. Um, And there's a specific point that he talks about in this blog post or article, whatever we're calling it on Forbes. And that is about SAFE. So SAFE for the unfamiliar is Scaled Agile Framework. It's a, it's a framework similar to Scrum or, or Kanban or XP where um, you have a set of processes in there. And it's safe is a little more prescriptive than other frameworks because it's, it's pretty process heavy compared to some other frameworks. So there's that. Um, but at the end of the day, it is built on what you would consider some standard, quote unquote, agile practices like Scrum, XP, Kanban, uh, lean, things like that, and some scaling principles that have been um, some ideas that come from other things that other people have done, like um, Scrum as Scrums and, and concepts such as that. So basically, uh, his premise in the safe part, and I'm going to quote this, um, and this is a quote, a particularly unfortunate form of branded Agile, and he quotes that, concerns scaling frameworks. These schemes are aimed at helping firms that have some teams implementing Agile practices and want to resolve the tension between the Agile teams and back office systems, uh, which are typically monolithic and bureaucratic. Now, let's start there. He uses the word scheme, okay, which is a pretty negative connotation for something. So that's, that's my first kind of point as it seems like there is, a, there is an attack here on the scaled agile framework. And if you want to attack something, 
feel free, you know, by all means, you can attack something. But when we keep reading further down in the article, he points out um, that uh, the issue of his main issue is the customer here. It says a particularly worrying variant in safe essentially is the codified bureaucracy in which the customer is always totally absent. Okay, so that's the quote I want to give. And he drew a little. It is a little safe uh, place map, and he drew a picture. He drew a circle around a picture, and it says the word customer under under large solution. And in the context of safe, under large solution, that actually means something very specific. Okay. Not talking about every single customer in that context. So, the, so what he's saying is that the customer is always totally absent. So if we take a look at safe as defined by the safe website, um, it has things in place. For instance, the foundation of safe is Scrum, and Scrum is all about supposed to be about interacting with the customer, right? Uh, and then you have product managers and product owners in Scrum and things like vision roadmaps, uh, sprint reviews, system demos, uh, lean portfolio management. There's a lot of things in the safe framework that are there because we're supposed to be interacting with customers, interviewing customers, uh, getting their feedback. There's this whole idea of continuous exploration that is that is part of the uh, a part of Lean UX where we're interviewing potential customers and trying to find out if we're building the wrong things before we build it and all these types of things, right? So there's meant to be a lot of customer interaction. So just the very idea that you would point out um, something about safe and say that's where the customer lies because there's one small little picture on a, a placemat uh, shows that uh, I, I just think it's a bit unfair and I think it's a bit of a straw man argument. And for those who aren't familiar, that's just basically attacking something which is not what, what the real uh, thing is. You're basically setting it up saying, this is what safe is. Meanwhile, I would, if Dean or someone involved with safe was to defend themselves, I would, sh I would be sure that they wouldn't suggest that that's where the only place the customer lies is in the large solution portion of the framework. So that's my kind of complaint about this article. Um, and I feel like it's a bit unfair. And I also feel like um, the people that are involved in SAFE, particularly the companies that are doing it, um, I'm sure you're going to have um, successful SAFE transformations and unsuccessful ones and in between and everything else. Because like any framework or any process, the people and the behaviors behind it are what makes it or breaks it, right? SAFE is only as good as the behaviors and just like Scrum and just like Waterfall, to be honest with you. So really, it's it's not so much, I wouldn't argue that it's safe the problem or safe doesn't talk about the customer or have part of safe where the customer lies or the interaction is supposed to be. Maybe the experiences he's talking about are from poor um, transformations and that could be, but I even went on his Twitter and I, I can't speak for Steve, but it does seem like he doesn't have that much experience with the safe transformations from what I've seen the back and forth on Twitter. So, gentlemen, I've been talking for about five minutes. So, what are your thoughts? So, I think Denning had some creative marketing in his article a little bit to promote. I think it's his new book, The Age of Agile, where he talks about three laws. And the, one of the laws is the law of the customer. And everyone in the organization should be obsessed with adding more value to external customers slash end users. So he talks about, about that a lot. Um, so there might be some propaganda in the article. Now, I, I don't disagree with a lot of what, he, what he's stating because there is no single bullet or silver bullet strategy. Um, I don't necessarily agree fully on his safe point of view. I think there's flaws in all the frameworks, just like there's flaws in, in <laughs> Waterfall, RUP, whatever you want to, whichever direction you want to go. But um, I think that the safe one maybe it just hits closer to home since that's primarily what, what I see in the market, uh, dealing with larger enterprise transformations. And again, it's, it's when you start to scale, you know, is it, are you scaling too fast? Are you jumping too fast? Do you have it fully defined where you want to go and why you even want to scale? What, what's the value trying to be delivered? 
Have you prepared the organization for the change? So a lot of these things are never truly vetted out. It's, it's really just, you know, shotgun, you know, pull the trigger and shoot. So it, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. So I could see more and more people getting frustrated with scaling frameworks or even just agile in general, right? It's just this big word now that encompasses so many different things. And Troy, you said something in the beginning around business agility. So, you know, it, now we're starting to, to change how we talk about agile. It's not, but agile is business agility, just like business agility is a part of agile. So understanding how to scale that type of effort is a real challenge. And, um, you know, I, I, I think the article is thought provoking if nothing else. Sure. Paul, what do you think? Yeah, so a couple of things. I mean, I'm I'm really attempting to turn over a new leaf in 2019 and really try to draw on the good that I see in things and, and not maybe beat up as much as I probably have in the past. I've got a few podcasts where I'm guilty of being on record and, and, and you know, what's done is done. But I really want to move forward with, look, there's some, instead of going in for the attack, it's, Hey, you know what I like about SAFE? I like the two-day program increment planning. That's a great event, right? Talk about the things that are good at, right? instead of bashing it. That said, I, I mean, I, there's a lot of familiarity with SAFE gone bad in this article, but this is a really short article, guys. It's, it's, it's not got a ton of depth to it, and it does look like it's teeing up for the three laws of Agile that Deming is putting forward, which I like, by the way. Right, but uh, but the attack on safe with the diagram, and he's not the first one in our um, circle on on the internets to point that out. Uh, um, it is wrong. It is a straw man. Uh, it, right. It's the it's the one time the word customer is on the placemat. Right, but that's not that's not in reality the one time we think about the customer. So the argument goes we agree that customers should be centric, whether it's Deming's three laws that he's coming up with here or the manifesto in 2001, customers should be pretty darn important. XP before that, Scrum before that. Um, it's only represented one time on the small placemat, therefore safe must be bad. That's a bad argument. Right, exactly. That, that, that's my point in, in, in particular, um, the most recent client I've been at which is a um, which has gone through still going through a safe transformation, but um, like anything, I don't know if a transformation is ever done. Meaning, there's always room to improve, of course, right? But the idea of what people would consider, what his argument would be, is it, quote unquote installing safe, right? If you want to think of it that way. Um, the people behind it, particularly the people that would be normally focused on the customer, which should be everybody. And that, if that's his argument, I don't disagree with that. But if you think about it, um, you know, we have a team of product owners and uh, product, product managers and um, product directors and lean portfolio management. And we do continuous exp exploration and discovery combine and continuous exploration. And, and it's, it's this iterative process to constantly figure out, you know, how, how can we spend the least amount of time and money, uh, but build the right thing? You know, how can we find out what the wrong thing is and how can we buy actually trying to focus on delivering to the market quicker, right? And so we can get the feedback faster and doing that lean UX stuff ahead of time before we build anything, right? So it's a combination of both. And it's all customer centric, and you're talking about B2B customers, B2C customers, right? And it's a balance between, you know, it's always a balance between prioritization for short term and long term, but it's always about uh, getting the highest return on investment and satisfying the customer to potentially get your highest return on investment, whether that's monetarily investment or return, whether that's, you know, market share or customer satisfaction, those types of things. So, I, and this is, a, this is a company that's doing safe. So that's why when I see this uh, article, it just seems like it's, it's either, it's a bit nonsensical to me. Yeah, and I think it's something that Paul, you know, to echo something that Paul said around, you know, he's seen a lot of bad safe, right? So 
I think we tend to see more safe environments being challenged because they don't look at it the way that you described it, Troy. So they're not looking at how do we deliver value to the customer or they're not looking at it necessarily as, you know, what's most valuable, you know, based upon cost or the cost of delay. How do we measure return of investment, um, which is hard if you don't define it in a certain way or even be open to defining it differently than it's been defined in the past. So I think it's a challenge of, of organizations not just looking for solutions, right? So how do we define our own path based upon where we want to go, utilizing these frameworks in, in the way that they were intended and not bastardizing them to fit our non-different ways of working? You just don't want to overlay this on top of the way you work and think it's going to change. Totally right. agree with that last statement. That, and that's... That should be a criticism of not just safe. It should be a criticism of any framework where you're really not willing to re-examine and change. You're just looking to map what you're doing in the, in the cloak or the costume of the framework. But the frameworks can never be to blame, in my opinion. I mean, it's really the organization. Agreed. So, you know, the fact that you're looking at a framework to solve your problem is is a bit short-sighted if you haven't done the due diligence to truly understand what the root causes are of your issues and as an organization how you're going to prioritize what you want to start driving or experimenting towards change can't just go in and be like oh, everyone's going to do this now or i guess you could <laughs> see how well that works well i think if you haven't seen it i'm sure you have i mean i would like to think we all have seen it uh the top down We've bought a uh, canned solution, be it safe or otherwise. Here's what your new title is. Here's what your organization structure now looks like. Uh, oh, no input, big surprise. That happens. Yeah. Well, let's take it. Let's take, let's descale for a second here. Okay. Descale. So Scrum is like 17 pages, right? the Scrum guide. Right. Now, how many times have you guys seen scrum teams okay, who don't do what's in that 17 pages? Okay, let's start there. 100% of the time. <laughs> okay. 100% of the question, time. The question, the, is, it, the question is like, is it really that it's that hard to understand? What, I, I, here's, here's what I mean, because I'm making a bigger point about state, that I. I, it's either it's either a few things I think. One, there's maybe some laziness when it comes to like no one wants to really understand what the heck the Scrum Guide is talking about. Like there's this idea that we're going to learn it vicariously through somebody else or through osmosis or through a couple YouTube videos. I don't know, and then go try to implement it without actually. So many times I've talked to Scrum masters and I say, "Have you read the Scrum Guide?" And like most of them haven't even read it. Like, how could you be a scrum master and not even understand the basics of what you what a scrum master, like the basic process? It's just a little bit like, it's weird to me. So if you, if I say, hey, that's one agile framework for one team, right? That most people don't follow. And then scale that up to this placemat. And the safe website is like hundreds of pages. Okay? Right. No Very it's no surprise that if people don't even want to actually try to do Scrum correctly, and Scrum, let's be honest, according to this placemat, is the foundation of SAFE because the foundation of SAFE is Agile Teams and the most popular framework is Scrum, right? So if the most popular framework, is, the, which is the foundation which we're meant to be scaling is Scrum, and if people don't even do that correctly or don't even attempt to do it correctly, which is a lot of cases that I've seen, then how could we possibly expect a, something as large and complex as SAFE is going to be implemented correctly? So let's, maybe we can get to talk about that for a second, the root cause of this. <laughs> so <laughs> as far as, I don't really think it's SAFE is what I'm saying. And I don't think it's Scrum either. There's some root cause going on here that's like, I remember, you know, people would study for their PMP and they would, rem they would memorize the PMBOK inside and out, right? But nobody does that with the Scrum Guide. <laughs> it's a really interesting, I don't know, it's a, it's, what do you guys think? Well, to be fair, I, I've 
got the PMP certification and that exam requires memorization of the damn <laughs> book um, <laughs> versus a CSM or CSPO just, you know, it's not even on the same level of, of difficulty of a test. Um, but just memorizing uh, to pass that test versus day-to-day -day PMP back when I did Gantt charts, uh, no. Nobody used the entire framework of that either. Yeah, but I also think that um, when you're moving into a scaling model, let's let's just say your your Scrum practice is crappy as well, but you decide that oh, we're doing things different. Let's scale. You're now starting to, to and this is my opinion, where in the waterfall world or non-agile universe, you would get the divide, right? Business versus IT, or IT right. versus business. When you start to scale and when you talk about safe, you're starting to build, trying to build that bridge between business and IT and break down the divide. So you start to clash and there's not a partnership there. And I don't think safe, it, it, it doesn't help people understand that there's, that's the partnership or spends enough time in that area. And I know it's sprinkled throughout and I've done enough uh, <laughs> safe implementations, which I don't even like to say, but transformations to, to last me with quite, quite a bit of white papers under my belt. But um, I do think that that is a gap, right? So how do we bridge the, the business versus the IT mentality and, and, and allow them to create together and strip that, you know, those verticals away and just say, we're a team, right? Just like Scrum. It's the team. What's our team agreement? How do we choose to work? How do we choose to hold our, each other accountable? How do we choose to honor our commitments? So when you look at it from a team perspective, you can break down that, that divide a little bit or not even honor it in that way because literally you're looked at as a team. You're not looked at as, well, you're the business and we're IT. And often you see, well, we tell you what to do. You go deliver it. And it's just not a good partnership model. Yeah, I'm reading um, War, Peace, and IT by Mark Schwartz right now. And that's the, uh, it's the flip side of Seat at the Table, where he was trying to help the IT leadership understand the, the business side of the house. This is the flip-flop of that. This is helping the business side of the house understand IT leadership. Yeah, and, I mean, it's, it's a weird dynamic. It and, is. You know, it, is. Then, it, it comes out of a management era. It's yesterday's era. And, and maybe even out of budgeting, right? So IT has their own budget. Business has their own budget. Projects have budgets, which span across both. And as opposed to going towards more lean, agile budgeting and, and budgeting, you know, funding teams uh, in that mindset. But even still, even when I've seen teams funded, it, it's culture. It's, it's a bunch of different combinations. But um, that, that's where I think where a lot of the scaling challenges really erupt, right? There, it's a very visceral reaction. What do I do that? I no longer have a job or, you know, that's, that's for it. We don't have to do that. We're the business. So we don't, we don't dabble in that. So um, I'll, I'll pause there. I can go on and on and on and ramble about that nonsense. <laughs> well, I got, I got a quote. I got another quote here from the article and it says, my question would be, why would anyone with a genuine Agile mindset be using safe in the first place? <laughs> I just I've definitely run thing. into people who think that, that but, but they, to be fair, I don't think they've actually tried it. They haven't studied it. Um, that's what I mean. That's yeah. my issue with this, is that if that's the case, but you're writing for Forbes, right, that I just think it's, it's not, I, I think if this was coming from a place of deep experience with safe, then I would say, okay, I mean, <laughs> I can't, you know, that's your experience. And, but it does seem like this is a little bit questioning why would anyone with a general agile mindset be using safe in the first place and drawing a, a circle around a picture of a customer. So I, I would, I would answer that question with, well, safe, um, as defined on the website, okay, uh, its foundation is lean and agile. And it combines things like lean budgeting and lean portfolio management and uh, lean UX and Scrum and DevOps and Kanban and all this stuff. 
And it all can work really well if it's done well, right? So it kind of gives you all these different tools and value streams and everything else. So I don't see anything wrong with the tools themselves. Only see what potentially could go wrong in our Scrum example. So yeah, but to like, be fair, I mean, th this is a brief as heck article, and it's four paragraphs, dog and safe. It's four paragraphs. Um, <laughs> it clearly activated something in you, brother. <laughs> I, mean, that, oh, I just, I just, but it's a small. I just don't like is, that. Is, that straw man thing. If we go to the top of, you know, you know what. What kicked off the article, Understanding Fake Agile, he had numerous people asking him, what is this fake agile? And we do talk about fake agile in the industry, don't we? I've said it before. Yeah, I mean, we've all said it, or I've said it as well. I don't know if Troy has ever gone on record saying it. So I don't know. I have executives, yeah. probably from the business side of the house, who are having a hard enough time understanding agile, and they start hearing fake agile. Well, no, what, what's this? Well, they see, they see the word fake agile. Write the article. Right. So let's take a look at let's take a look at this for example. They have a, there's an article here that on Forbes it says understanding fake agile, and there's a picture of Jeff Bezos, okay, and <laughs> in his guns a blazing uh, um, <laughs> photo op. Yeah. <laughs> so so I, I don't have a. Jeff Bezos, maybe the most successful man in the world, one of them, right? Okay, fair enough. It's not about Jeff Bezos, right? But if you're going to use Amazon as your example of a real agile company, which is what it sounds like he's doing, okay, in this article when I read it, this problem, that's problematic because Amazon is known to treat their employees like robots. And according to the Agile Manifesto, that's not what you're supposed to do so you would well, they say, gotta train the robots somehow <laughs> so according to the agile manifesto you would say while amazon is doing part of agile probably very well the rest of it's fake right according to his own argument that's what i would say so yeah say, and yes and yes. denning even says i mean in, in one of his quotes, the core idea of Agile is simple, human beings creating more value for other human beings. So I don't know if I would go too far down the, the Bezos uh, rabbit hole, but um, Denning's been at this a long time. So yeah. He's been in Agile for an extremely long time. I have, I have to say, I have a lot of um, admiration and respect for him from the stuff that I've read. So uh, I, that's why I feel this, this article is to provoke <laughs> people in a way to get us talking, which is good, right? So we, this is a good, these are good topics to, to beat up because I do think to, to both your points and, and Paul, I think you were going there is, you know, or you, you went there around, you know, it, people always have an opinion. I had an opinion of SAFE and until I've actually studied, went through my SPC and, and implemented and, and launched numerous trains, I have a newfound respect for it. So. I didn't have that respect for it before I, I worked in the environments that were implementing it. So, um, you know, yeah, I, I, I guess everyone's I entitled to an agree. opinion. <laughs> My first taste of safe was in an environment that was abusing it. Uh, I didn't like what I saw. If I had left it at that, I would definitely have a huge negative opinion of, of safe. I actually went out and got not not the four day SBC, but the two day abbreviated safe for leaders or whatever, just to get a taste of it. I didn't want to train other people in safe, but I wanted to have an appreciation for it. So I went and took that on my own dime uh, and then have had a couple of other opportunities to be around it and seen it done better. So, so I mean, I get it. I get it. I, I do think that large enterprises who've been doing older management command and control for such a long time are going to have a hard time with agile period amen and safe is the big i mean they did the best marketing scrum did the best marketing for the team level it's the most prevalent out there it's going to have a bullseye on its back but again four paragraphs i really don't think the hit was that bad <laughs> let me say this i don't know steve denning i mean i know who he is obviously i don't know him personally i'm sure he's a great guy uh, and I'm sure I have made many straw man arguments in the past myself. So 
my main point was about the straw man. It actually really isn't even about the state. <laughs> That's my main <laughs> with the whole argument. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, let me say this. Let me, let me do a little plug here. We have a new uh, something called Discord. Right. That's, that's, what, that's what the app is called. Right. Discord. Yes. Um, and it's free. And obviously, you guys know we have a coalition, which is free. But Discord is an app similar to Slack, but it is actually free for the public, unlike Slack, which charges you after a certain amount of users. So we're opening this up as an experiment and you can join our Discord for free and join in conversations like this or any other conversations you like or questions or or, or you want to call me out for straw men that I have thrown out there in the past, feel free on Discord. Uh, so the link will be up in the description of how to get to the Discord app. And there's a mobile app, there's a website, and there's a desktop app. So pretty easy. So there, I just wanted to give that shameless little plug for the Agile Uprising Discord. All right, so let's talk about what is fake Agile. So that's the premise of the article, understanding fake Agile. So what do you guys think fake Agile is? What do you what do you think he means, and do you do you think there's such thing as quote unquote fake agile? Uh, I do think there's such a thing as fake agile. I think his okay. um, Denning's analogy was pretty good. Talks about what is it, the flamenco dancers putting on the costume and not knowing a thing about the steps. Um, I've heard uh, wagile, which is waterfall agile combination, or um, scrum fall. Right. I like um Sorry. I like Taco Agile. Do you, do you yeah. know Taco Agile? Titles and ceremonies only. Right. Yeah, titles and ceremonies only. <laughs> so we, you know, the, so this yeah. is the thing, and so you know, I, I I hear when I read this article, I thought I know how hard it is for leaders to understand Agile. Now they're hearing about fake Agile. How do you explain fake Agile to them? Um. What? Okay. Right. And so that. Taco's great. Titles and ceremonies right. only. That's a that's a great explanation. It, if you're a leader listening to this podcast, and believe it or not, we do have some leaders that listen to this podcast. I've been poked in the ribs about cursing like a sailor, but uh, that's kind of our style. <laughs> but um, if you're trying to understand fake agile, it, it is not pushing uh, and delegating authority deeper down into the organization. Now. Um, David Marquet talks about you've got to be responsible about how much you push down. You've got to push down to the capability, right? You don't just completely push down uh, and delegate everything. You're, you're asking for a mess there too. But right. if you're not willing to delegate, if you're still command and control, you, you might not be agile. You could turn this into a Jeff Foxworthy routine, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you're doing X, Y, and Z, you might not be agile. Um, if you've just taken everybody that used to have the title of project manager and deem them a scrum master, you might be missing a few things, right? So <laughs> that's a great, that's a great quote, uh, Paul. I think you win the podcast. But. This is no, I'm not. You know, I'm, I, <laughs> I want to take seriously that first off, Deming is somebody who who I do listen to on a lot of topics. Um, he's um, He's got a lot of good things to say. This is a kind of a hit article in there on on safe. That's that's a bit unfair. But the the challenge of how do we explain fake agile to our customers and the leaders and the organizations that we consult to? It's hard. How do you know whether you're doing it doing it justice or not? All right, I'm going to give a really simplistic answer, and maybe this is just me being simplistic, and that's okay. Step back from the scrum guy, which is 17 pages. The Agile Manifesto is two pages. It's, <laughs> it's 12 principles and four values. Damn, right. Amateur, you took my thunder, man. <laughs> I, was, I was holding on. You stole my thunder. Right. Chime in. No, no. no. We're so intellectually lazy as a society <laughs> that we cannot read two pages and look at that two pages and say, are we doing this or not? If the answer is no, then we're not doing Agile. I mean, that, or we're not being Agile, I should say. So I, I don't know. I think we overcomplicate this stuff way too much. It, exactly. And I think that <laughs> even before you, you dig into the manifesto, it's, it's what do we want to change about the way we work? What is important for us to do differently? 
So taking, taking the leap of faith that, wow, we can't continue to do things the way we have been, we're going to have to change at some point. So how do we live within the constant cycles of change, but organize around work differently? So, and that's where, to me, the manifesto fits so perfectly, right? Even just the four, four statements of the manifesto, you know, don't even look down to the principles. Those four statements just still ring true today. And it's so important to, to think in that way, in my mind, to even become more agile in, in your thinking and within the organization, because you've heard me say this stupid quote, you know, companies aren't agile. So we have to focus on making people agile. So the more, you know, focus around making our people agile, the more agility we can achieve within the organization. Yeah, that's a great point. And I will say this, one of the things I do when I work with new teams or do team resets is we do a deep dive into the manifesto and we do um, principles as metrics. And essentially we, we kind of assess ourselves or the team assess themselves on how well they're doing at each principle after they understand what the principle means. Right. And you can use that as a barometer for improvement of, short and long term you say how do we get better at principle one how do we get better at principle four we're weak in these areas right so to me that is something that is is pretty powerful for a team and an organization imagine if you had leadership doing something similar to that right so we we talk about you know interfacing with customers often we talk about or on a daily basis right we talk about delivering continuously early right uh, with high quality and, 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 and good design and those principles and sustainable work and trust and motivation and all these types of awesome things that are in the Agile Manifesto. Yeah, it seems like, you know, 2% of people have read it. So no, that's, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I do think for if I'm a chief marketing officer that the manifesto may need some discussion, that the reading the two pages isn't, isn't going to drive it home. Sure. But sure. I, I do like, one way to answer is fake agile going on here is is use the principles behind the manifesto as metrics right yeah um that's pretty good i like that yeah but not everything's a delivery project right so if you're trying to achieve more business agility and you're focusing on the business side of things i think it's important to understand how we how they navigate change as well as be innovative and and not fall upon the risk adverse you know, pitfall that, that we can't change because these are the things we have to do because they're written in somewhere that we were told to do them. And we've been conditioned over X amount of years to, to follow the rules. So I think there's a, there's two parts of that. I mean, I love the, the principles as, as metrics. I actually have never thought about that before. So to me, that's quite genius, Troy. Um, but <laughs> I, it, doesn't, it doesn't span. So I think this is where, and I may get kicked in the teeth for saying this, but I think what we're talking about and, and something you were talking about, Troy, specifically around teams and how do they measure and how do they know they're doing things in an agile fashion, it's hard to scale that. And I think that's where the trap becomes is like, okay, now we have a, one or two teams running effectively, you know, however they're measuring themselves differently. And now we want to, you know, roll this out in the next six months to 4,000 more people. <laughs> With, and that's right. where SAFE comes in, right? So not to thread it back to SAFE, but I think it's not, it's not understanding that these pockets are happening. How do you harness the good out of it, but also talk about the challenges getting there? It wasn't just overnight people started to work differently and started to show progress or gain efficiency or optimize whatever we want to buzz call it but literally what what was the process how did they how did they feel what was the reaction what was the resistance how long did it take what you know what changed someone's heart to open up their mind who knows i'm feeling old again i mean i i remember when the manifesto came out and and i resonated with we're uncovering better ways and i felt like at the time so was i so were the people around me right. um XP was just prior to that, at least for me, 99. Um, if there was buzz about it before 99, I wasn't hip to it. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing a variant of Spiral. I actually thought I invented it 
didn't realize <laughs> it was probably deeply seated in my brain from college and I just hadn't had the chance to use it until 93. Okay. Um, and I do think that, that my, the way I thought the world was in 2001 is we were pushing back on projects and Gantt charts and asking for predictability in an unpredictable universe and saying, look, th there's a better way to get an outcome that's going to be good. Uh, it, it definitely involves working with the customer and collaborating. Um, it involves doing things smaller, not trying to, you know, you fought so hard to get X dollars for the project. Let's throw in everything but the kitchen sink under that budget and, and let's keep everybody engaged and, and uh, keep doing small value stuff. Uh, no, right? So I don't know. I, f I feel like I just tangented somewhere. Sorry about that. I, <laughs> I, 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 I'm just like the manifesto itself was 18 years old. Right. That's 18 years ago. And, and that's how I felt at the time. And it's still a good work. But I do think we have done some improvements. Since. Uh, I'm not pointing to anybody's particular shtick. I mean, it's big business agile at this point. But um, the manifesto isn't the end all be all of agile at this point either, in my opinion. No. And I think I don't know if I, I'm going to talk for Troy, but I think it's a good, great starting point. And then also it's a great place to bring things back to center, right? Why let's re, you know, re level set or let's review these again and see how we're either honoring them or not, or have we totally abandoned it? You know, to me, the whole fake agile thing is you can't be a little bit pregnant. So either you are, or you aren't. So either you're going to go down the path of agility and you're going to learn as an organization through constant inspect and adapt cycles and, and literally retrospective activities and, and, prioritizing changes within the work that you're doing and focus on that as an organization. Cause to me, the customer also is the organization. So that's another customer in your, in your cycle. So not just external, but the internal customer, meaning the company. So. Well, I'll give you guys my, my last thoughts on this. So something going on in the background here. Okay. All right. <laughs> Okay. Um, my last thoughts on this. So going back to the article, we could criticize safe or scrum or dad or less or whatever framework, whatever certifying bodies we can criticize everything because it's easy to criticize other people. At the end of the day, everyone's selling something. Okay, so <laughs> meaning you, me, everyone on this call is selling something, okay? meaning we're selling our services to make money, and so is Scaled Ultra Framework, and so is Steve Denning, okay? Everyone's selling something. What I will, my, I will say this, there's no way that there's, you can say, this is what the safe guide says, <laughs> We're going to implement it just like it says day one and everything is going to be good. Okay. That's not how the world works. Same as we're going to do a hodgepodge of different scaling frameworks and use a meta framework and we're going to install this too. And we're going to do, there's no one right way to do anything. And at the end of the day, it's all about meeting people where they're at. Okay. Understanding where they're at and using the, the tools that they feel comfortable with and or we have the experience with, whatever the case is, to get to the outcomes that they want to achieve. And usually it's meant to be agility, right? Going back to the manifesto and business agility and all that. So this, to me, this idea of saying that this framework is, is dark or this framework is not real agile and blaming this, to me, it's all, it's just... That my argument for this whole podcast is not the right path. So no, I agree with you, Troy. Yeah, it, it's it's not the positive path forward. Yeah. And one last example. I've always been against playbooks. Yeah. I think. I thought you said you uh, you've always been against Playboy. I was going to say we have to edit this. No. Too. Oh, no, my bad. Well, I'm going to give you a real life example. Okay. 
I've always been against playbooks. The idea that you would write something out on a piece of paper and say, go implement this, and then that's supposed to solve people's problems. Okay. And essentially, that's what, the, if you think about it, that's what the scrum guide is and the same thing is. It's essentially a giant playbook. Okay. So, but I've been asked at pretty much every place I've been to write playbooks for things. Okay. And usually I resist at first because I try to say, let's just work on this together. But, you know, going back to, I'm going to really bring it back to a previous podcast. Going back to uh, Spiral Dynamics is something I try to utilize is that, you know what, for some, in some circumstances, maybe writing a playbook is really beneficial for that person or those people, right? And maybe they read that thing and they're like, yeah, I, I think I know how to do it now. And they go try it and then they iterate on it themselves. Who am I to say that writing a playbook is wrong? That's what I've, I've, I've learned that. Okay. So my point is, it's not, it's not, there's no one right way to do anything. And it's, and I, I just find the concept of calling things fake agile and real agile as, as though we are the arbiters of truth around what agile is. Essentially agile is defined in the manifesto. If it's living up to that, it's real. If it's not, it's not regardless of the framework or somebody who's trying to sell you something. That's my last Well, I'm not, I'm not sure I can follow that, but, um, (laughs) yeah, I, I, yeah. Wow. Troy, kudos. Well, well said. Um, I think for me, it's, it's just, I I appreciate the article. I like anything that gets people talking and, and beating up the ideas as well as debating. So, um, I do think that, yes, there was a focus on a particular framework this being safe in the article, but as Paul keeps alluding to, it's a very short article. So, um, I think, you know, it's, it's companies being willing to, to be riskier and, and really focus internally on, on building better leadership around how do we build our vision and define our goals and align to those goals and deliver upon them and organize around work. And, and I think that, um, any ability to focus on change and align towards towards common goals and vision um, takes a lot of horsepower at the at the top level. And uh, I keep hoping and keeps me employed. I love my job, so all this angst and pain is is you know for me. I, it's the messier the better. Um, if it if it helps organizations be better by treating their people better and giving people pride in what they do or giving people back pride in what they do. I think it would be a, uh, I don't care what you call it. If that's, if that's the end result, call it whatever you want. I'm on board with that. And Paul, before I ask you for your last thoughts, I just want to make, I just want to say one more thing. It's on my mind. I want you to put yourself in the position of someone who's been, who's working full time at a company who's going through a safe transformation who is trying their best. Maybe they're a scrum master, a manager, a developer, whatever, okay? And they're trying their best and they're seeing some benefit. Maybe they're finally starting to get it and they get a message about, oh, there's a new article about fake agile on Forbes and it's shitting on safe, right? (laughs) So what you're doing is not real, okay? And essentially what you're doing is not real agile, so try again. It's like, get out of here. So, sorry. <laughs> that's, a, that's why I got all worked up about this podcast. So, uh, <laughs> No, no, and I love the passion. Uh, and the passion, I'd like to think our audience loves the passion too. So kudos to you for, for coming up with the topic. Listen, I'm glad they're talking about Agile. Because I will tell you from 93 when I picked up the marker and said there's a different way. <clears throat> Forget the Gantt chart. Give us a little bit of money. We'll go after the highest value thing. We'll go after the highest risk thing. Um, those conversations were tough in 93. They're not tough anymore. They're expected that we're going about things. Now people want to know how do we do it. And that's what this article also, the fact that, that the C-suite is asking how do they recognize Agile from fake Agile is a good thing. So I'm glad for that. Um, well, I feel like part of my purpose, if you will, is to bridge the old world to the new world. And I'd like to think that there'll be a time 50 years in the future where it's not as hot of a debate about these kinds of topics and it's a more natural, more humane work 
working environment. But I don't think it's going to be an easy battle. But this shows progress to me. The fact that we have this conversation, the fact that that article, and it, it didn't just activate you, boy, it was a Twitter storm. I got some kind of thing about how hot it was to my Twitter account. I don't know if you guys did. Uh, <laughs> yes, it was, it was a Twitter storm. I read it. And then I was like, wow, we should do a podcast on this. So I'm glad for that. Good. Let's keep talking about it. So let's thank Steve for writing the article, even though I disagreed with it, but we can thank him <laughs> for that because it, it led to this podcast and the right. discussion. And, and I'll even plug his book. I think he has a book. It's either coming out or it's out called The Age of Agile, maybe something like that. Yeah. Um, the Age of Agile. Um, it, it is available. Okay. Um, so if you're interested in Steve Denning's work, that's maybe a, a good place to start related to Agile. So, um, well, thanks guys. I appreciate uh, your time. Any, anything you want to plug anywhere that we can, people can reach you. Uh, you can always hit us up on the, uh, the, uh, Agile uprising site. Now the new discord and you can find me out at, uh, on my Twitter feed on, uh, lean left. Nothing else to promote, though. <laughs> okay. All right. And uh, Paul, what about you? Yeah, I mean, uh, paulelia.com. Sorry, dude, the actor, comedian, Paul Elia. I'm not giving up the domain name. I fought for 17 years to get it. I'm keeping it. When I die, I'll leave it in the will to you. Um, that's how you can find me. All right. Very good. And you can find me on Twitter at G4S Troy and on the new Discord. And the link will be in the description. Uh, but I warned you, if you follow me on Twitter... You may see a lot of things not related to Agile, but that's your, um, that is your destiny. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all right. Well, uh, thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> Enjoyed it. <laughs>